Well, welcome to session two of the Cancer and Environment Forum 2022. What does new science say about the chemicals and cancers uh, that are all around us? Uh, lessons from public health and environmental medicine. I'm Tim Rebick from the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute and Harvard Chan School. Uh, this workshop is sponsored by the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the Silent Spring Institute, the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production, the Zoo Family Center for Global Cancer Prevention, the Cancer Free Economy Network, Mass General Brigham, and the Center for Cancer Equity and Engagement of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. We had a terrific first session in this forum uh, in the first uh, unit on February 3rd. Uh, in session one, Kate Guyton spoke about the multiple streams of evidence used by the International Agency for Research on Cancer to categorize chemicals as known or suspected carcinogens and the key characteristics of carcinogens. Mary Beth Terry addressed the topic of gene environment interactions, noting that can a rising cancer incidence in people under 50 can't be due to genetic changes alone. And she highlighted her research on exposures to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons air, in air pollution, grilled and smoked food, et cetera. Uh, and her uh, work demonstrates the importance of studying subpopulations. For example, people exposed to particular windows of vulnerability like prenatally or pu in, during puberty. Uh, we then heard from stakeholders involved with the Wilmington Can uh, Childhood Cancer Cluster about the, their roles in working with public health officials to identify uh, and investigate unusual occurrences of cancer in their community in the, during the 1990s. Um, and the panel raised a very important question, what might have been done sooner to eliminate the exposures that caused these cancers? So it was a great session. And if you haven't seen it, it is recorded online and we encourage you to visit those, uh, see those talks and, and visit the website. So today, today's session is focused on air pollution and cancer. Uh, the science linking air pollution to cancers is strong. Given that reducing exposures is often beyond the control of the individual, what are the opportunities for addressing air pollution in public health, research and community settings, and what roles can clinicians play? So as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question anytime during uh, the, the session, and we will have time for questions uh, after the talks, please type the question into the Q&A area found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please specify in the question if it's directed to a specific speaker or directed to everyone, anyone. And we'll answer as many questions as time allows. So without further ado, let me introduce the moderator for today's session, Dr. Polly Hoppen, who will set some important context with her remarks, including the topics and speakers, and moderate a panel following the presentations. So Dr. Hoppen is a research professor of public health in the Department of Public Health and the program director for environmental health at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production, uh, where she uh, designs and conducts policy relevant research to address environmental contributors to chronic disease. Um, prior to appoint her appointment at UMass, uh, Dr. Hoppen served as a senior advisor to the Department of Health and Human Services and at the Environmental Protection Agency uh, following a decade in the not-for-profit sector. So we're really grateful to her and her colleagues for the partnership in planning this forum series. Polly, take it away. Thank you so much, Tim. It's such a privilege to be moderating this session and I wanna thank all of the people involved in planning it as well as all of the participants. Um, your contributions in the Q&A are gonna be um, a real addition to this session as um, we get toward the end of our speakers. So I'm gonna do um, three things in um, my introductory remarks. Um, I'm going to first talk about trends in air pollution in the U.S., especially the variations that we see in exposure. And I'll spend a couple minutes then on the role of policy, since that's not going to be covered by our speakers. And last, I'm going to say something about a systems approach for integrating environmental pollutants into cancer prevention. So air pollution is an example of an important environmental contributor to cancer which by and large is not considered in cancer prevention research and science. Since 1970s, environmental not health agencies have been responsible for protecting people from large scale environmental exposures. Medical and nursing schools, public health training, clinical and research roles, all of these 
typically overlook environmental chemicals and pollutants, perhaps because we assume someone else is taking care of them, or perhaps because we don't know how we can engage. So air pollution is important for cancer prevention in itself. It's also a useful case study for thinking about the powerful role that health professionals and community partners can play in reducing environmental carcinogens. So how are we doing on air pollution in this country? The answer is overall, on average, steadily better, at least for the six so-called criteria pollutants, which include particulate matter, which as you'll hear later, is of primary concern for cancer. You can see here the downward trends in the average levels um, of these six um, uh, criteria pollutants so that they now mostly meet the standards required by the Clean Air Act. And uh, lower levels for these may be coming. But the distribution of this pollution is not even or equal. This slide shows that the average concentrations of particulate matter across the country over the last 18 years, which is a time frame that's very relevant for cancer risk, um, areas in dark gray meet the guidelines that are established by the World Health Organization, whereas areas in orange do not meet the guidelines. There's also variations in exposures to a class of over 180 chemicals that are called air toxics. And many of these are carcinogens like benzene or perchloroethylene, that sweet chemical that you smell when you're at the dry cleaner. They're of particular concern in urban areas across the country, and the trends on air toxics are not as clear. EPA uses its National Air Toxics Assessment, or NADA, to collect data that allow them to estimate health risks from these air toxics. Those data are often out of date. The most recent are from 2014. And for air toxics, they show that in many places, trends are stable. In some others, they're decreasing, but in others, they're increasing. And in many other places, there are insufficient data um, to really know. This is a map of the estimated cancer risk from air toxics that's calculated as part of the National Air Toxics Assessment. NADA estimates the cancer risk posed by hazardous pollutants by census tracts, and those are displayed here. The colors reflect the estimates of numbers of additional cases of cancer per million that are likely to occur with such exposures over a person's lifetime. So you can see that there's a lot of variation in the estimated cancer risk associated um, with air toxics across the country. This is St. John the Baptist Parish, uh, Louisiana, in the notorious um, Cancer Alley. And here an analysis of NADA found that emissions of air toxics from a particular plant caused the highest potential risk of cancer from airborne pollutants of any place in the country. The estimated risk of an individual getting cancer from the air toxics here was 1,505 per million, or 15 times higher than the risk that EPA considers unacceptable, which is supposed to trigger action on EPA's part toward reducing risk. And this doesn't take into account either the exposures that the community may have um, to the variety of cancer risk factors that we know um, and often think about with regard to cancer like tobacco, but it also doesn't include the often substantial exposure from diesel particulate matter um, or risks from under other sources that are indoors um, or other routes of exposure like ingestion or skin. Cancer rates are also elevated in St. John the Baptist Parish, and this suggests many cancer prevention opportunities here, both those that are focused on risk factors that we're most familiar with, but also reducing air pollution. There are three carcinogens that are shown here in the, in the bars um, that uh, are responsible for the majority of the cancer risk, that's chloroplene, ethylene oxide, and formaldehyde. Uh, they drive most of the air toxics risks so that if these three chemicals were substantially reduced, cancer risk from air toxics would drop below the EPA benchmark of concern. We also see these variations um, of exposure in traffic related air pollution around the country. And here's Boston, where many of us are today. This is a slide depicting exposure to traffic related air pollution, which includes 2.5, a PM 2.5, as well as other carcinogens. It's a study by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and it concluded that over 50% of Boston's Latinx population and 45% of Boston's Asian and Black populations live in areas that are in the top quintile of traffic-related air pollution, and that compares to only 30% of Boston's white population. 
So as is true of point source pollution, um, mobile sources are often disproportionately impacting um, neighborhoods that are predominantly um, residents are low income and or black indigenous um, and other people of color. So how do these risks stack up against other cancer risk factors and the ones that um, we do learn about in, in medical and public health and nursing training? That also depends on your location. In conjunction with Doug Myers at Boise State University, our team at Lowell built a model to simulate complete smoking elimination and then to estimate the resulting reduction in the incidence of 12 types of cancer for which smoking is a known risk factor. And we found that smoking elimination would reduce incidence, uh, incidence substantially, and that's good and we know that's true, but that that reduction in inc incidence would be much less in some places than in others. So we found that smoking elimination would reduce, um, would reduce incidence in five counties, uh, urban counties, only by 8%, far less than the overall average of about 40% after total smoking elimination. In Allegheny County, uh, Pennsylvania, we used a tool that's actually available for, for public use to estimate um, what the incidence drop in lung cancer would be if smoking were to be completely eliminated. And the estimate there was that in that county, smoking incidents uh, or incidents of lung cancer would drop by 10.6% under that scenario of complete elimination of smoking, but that's far less than the average drop of 62% across the whole country uh, for lung cancer incidence reduction. So that raises the question, what else might be contributing to lung cancer in Allegheny County? And again, reiterates the point of the variations in air pollution exposure and associated cancer risk. So now I wanna just lay a little groundwork for the portion of our conversation that's gonna focus on solutions. Um, this is a framework for thinking about interventions that can reduce cancer risk from air pollution. So there are clearly things that individuals can do and that health professionals can support individuals in doing. And uh, those are gonna be discussed later in our session. But individuals can't completely control what they breathe. And so population level action is needed to give individuals resources uh, to take their own steps, but also to do what the individual cannot. We can think about population level interventions in three categories. Um, the first being programs that would be designed to impact many individuals. The second being institutional decisions. For example, an electroplating company changing a process to eliminate a carcinogen or a hospital reducing its waste stream and therefore its emissions. Um, and then also policy, and I'm just going to spend a, a minute or two on policy because it's uniquely powerful for cancer prevention um, regarding air pollution. The Clean Air Act is responsible for the major improvements in air pollution that have occurred in the U.S. and were reflected on that slide that I just showed earlier. These policy changes have been hard fought. Passing the legislation, implementing laws via regulation and enforcement, those are all the subject of fierce debate. And robust science that showed the health benefits of reducing exposure to air pollution, including research done here in Boston, has been instrumental in the effectiveness of the Clean Air Act. But the devil is in the local details and political pressure from industry, as well as a strong narrative that we're all familiar with that pits jobs against a healthy environment those contribute to lax enforcement of the Clean Air Act in some places. There are other policies which have been instrumental in reducing air pollution, and I include here the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which sets standards for permissible exposure levels in workplaces, and there are hundreds of, not thousands of cases of cancer that have been prevented because of those limits. Here um, is a slide that shows that um, the states can also have a really important policy impact on air pollution. Some states lag behind the federal government, others are in the lead when it comes to innovative policies. And among the examples of these displayed here that are um, either pending or in place in Massachusetts, I wanna lift up the Toxics Use Reduction Act, which has a 32 year track record of requiring a simple thing, and that is that companies producing and using high hazard chemicals have to report their use of those chemicals to the state, and they have to develop a toxic use reduction plan. And paired with technical assistance from the state and from the Toxic Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell, companies are identifying 
less hazardous but economically viable chemicals to serve the functions that they need. And trends in the production and use of carcinogens in Massachusetts show dramatic declines since the act was passed that are attributed to this really innovative law. Back when it was passed, the voices of community leaders as well as health scientists and other health professionals were instrumental in the passing of the Toxic Cease Reduction Act. And they play an ongoing role in decisions about adding chemicals to the list for priority action um, by Tura. So the key point here is that air pollution related changes are fruitful arena uh, for cancer prevention that, that are policy uh, related changes for air pollution. And that those policies include regulating polluters, but also incentivizing safer alternatives. And that you as trusted messengers in the community, doctors, nurses, health professionals, um, as well as community leaders can be influential in the passage of these laws. So the final offering that I have um, for you before turning it over to our other speakers is to encourage systems thinking as you consider how to engage on these issues. This is a strong element of the work that we do at the Lowell Center. Systems thinking asks the question, what is going wrong in the system that produces air pollution, that causes illnesses, that incurs high healthcare costs? And on the other hand, what are the promising trends or initiatives within that system that are going in the right direction with regard to environmental carcinogens? And what are opportunities for interventions in the system that if they were carried out simultaneously could actually shift the dynamics so that the system uh, much better advances health and well being. And an important component of systems thinking is considering feedback loops. This is one that I just wanted to show you briefly that keeps the system stuck and impedes progress toward reducing environmental chemicals and associated cancer risks. There are many feedback loops and systems and some get in the way like this one and others are heading in the right direction when it comes to reducing environmental exposures. So I'm not gonna take you all the way around this loop here, but you can see that, that one reality of how the system functions leads to the next, which leads to the next, and it creates a dynamic that will continue unless it's disrupted. But I did wanna focus on the lower portion of the slide because that involves all of us in this audience. Um, scientists contribute to this feedback loop that's going in the wrong direction because they're trained to be skeptical, which is a, a good quality, um, and trained to be reluctant to say that something is proven, for example, or reluctant also to make recommendations for policy or other actions based on their science, even when they think it's conclusive. So I imagine you share the DNA with me where we just, that's part of how we think about our work. And historically, there's been a firewall that scientists in particular, but clinicians and others also perceive between research or practice and policy and often don't cross that bridge, although more and more are learning how to do that. And we'll be talking more about that in session three. Health professionals who are caring for individuals are often reluctant to conclude that exposures cause disease um, because it, they don't know if it's true at the individual level, but it, but it is true at the population level. So how can people um, do both speaking accurately at both the individual and population level? So all of that results in trusted messengers um, reinforcing a dominant narrative that is actually aligned with the industry narrative that environmental chemicals are just a small problem or that their role in cancer is unproven. And no wonder that the public's then confused, throws its hands up in despair, believes that cancer is just bad luck and accepts health problems as inevitable. And therefore they don't organize, put pressure on elected officials, regulation remains relatively weak. So you can see how all that perpetuates itself. So, but understanding a problem like this really creates an opportunity. And at every place around this feedback loop and the others that exist in the system, there is the potential to disrupt the dynamic. So those of you who are government and health scientists, clinicians, um, and other health professionals can change your language about environmental chemicals to convey the seriousness of the concern and the opportunities for prevention. So without being inaccurate, um, your, your words can shift so that they help the public and people that are directly impacted to begin to see their own power in engaging in solutions and in calling on elected officials and others to take action. So the Lowell Center and partners have launched two networks of diverse organizations from across this system that have worked together to explore the dynamics of the system and are now collaborating on projects to catalyze this kind of change. And 
we would welcome your follow-up and participation. So that's my context setting, and I want to thank my colleagues um, who've contributed directly to this session, um, also to the participants in the two networks that I mentioned, the Cancer Free Economy Network, Cancer Environment Network of, of Southwestern Pennsylvania. These are wise people, and they bring their deep knowledge and their lived experience and vision to their work and to their lives, and they inspire me every day. So now I've got the pleasure of introducing our terrific speakers. Um, the first two, Judy o, uh, David Cristiani and Judy Wu, will discuss the scientific foundation for the links between air pollution and cancer. Um, do we know enough to declare air pollution a priority for cancer prevention? Why is air pollution relevant um, to practicing medical doctors and nurses? And then Mary White of the CDC is gonna provide a public health perspective focusing in on resources that are available um, to all of us. And our fourth speaker, Roseanne Bongiovanni, is gonna bring it home describing the impacts of air pollution in the community of Chelsea, Massachusetts, very close um, to Dana-Farber, and the successes that they've had in reducing those air pollution exposures and her perspective on the importance of community-based research and the role of health professionals um, in that research. Following the speakers, we're gonna invite responses and reflections from a panel of three terrific leaders. Um, and I will introduce them when we get to that. And we'll have then have a conversation um, with the panel and the speakers addressing as many of your questions as we can. So uh, let's turn it on to, turn it over to um, David Cristiani, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, the director of the Harvard Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health a physician in pulmonary and critical care at Mass General um, with research incident, uh, interests in a long career um, in occupational, environmental, and molecular epidemiology. So David, take it away. Thank you, Polly. Um, you'll have to stop sharing so I can start sharing. Yeah. Great. All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, probably, for that wonderful introduction. It's good to work with you again. So in my time, I'm going to cover um, some uh, aspects of air pollution and cancer. Uh, I'll highlight, of course, a couple of uh, the, the big, uh, well-known, well-established cancers, lung cancer, but there are many uh, others associated with ambient, what we call ambient air pollution, so community-based air pollution, another way to think about this. Um, Estimates now, and we do have much better data now than we had a few decades ago. Polly gave a great introduction of how this has been an uphill battle and how this battle never ends in terms of control of carcinogen uh, and a massive problem like air pollution. So we now estimated it kills about 4 million people per year globally. We are, of course, talking about a global um, cancer problem from ambient air pollution, not just local. At least 1.2 million cases our lung cancer cases, then moved to the US, um, of over a quarter of a million or almost a quarter of a million lung cancer cases annually. And it's estimated epidemiologically that at least 10% are due to air pollution and 14% uh, due to a combination of air pollution and smoking interactions. Um, but air pollution does cause other cancers. Even if I focus uh, as illustratively on lung cancer, we should keep in mind that there is growing evidence that air pollution causes cancer at multiple sites. Um, it's probably not a surprise when you look at some of the compounds that are contained in ambient air pollution. So anyone who studied toxicology would not be surprised that multiple sites uh, may be involved. Um, the mechanism of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, is absorption, metabolism, and distribution of inhaled carcinogens, uh, not just to the lung, but to uh, even far off or organisms and organs, such as bladder, kidney, uh, breast, uh, brain, uh, leukemias in kids, and childhood cancer studies, although limited by size, uh, are showing growing evidence for leukemia as well as other sites. So this is a very major concern of air pollution and cancer that goes beyond just lung cancer. I do want to make a comment on occupation and cancer. Occupational exposures are often quite high, much higher than in the ambient setting, but occupation by itself plays an interesting historical role in our understanding of environmental causes of cancer. Going back to the late 18th century, when a British physician found that London chimney suites, who were children, 
um, child labor, very Dickens sort of picture going on. They were small, so they can get up into chimneys and sweep out the soot, which is very high in polyaromatic um, compounds, as we all know now. He didn't know then uh, what the compounds were. He just knew they were getting sick from the soot-related uh, trapping um, of the material in the scrotal folds. These kids were getting scrotal cancer, and with hygiene, um, they were able to reduce or even eliminate at least that problem. So what we know about environmental exposures comes from these kinds of uh, kinds of historical disaster, health disasters. Uh, it took a long time even to identify what it was in soot that caused cancer. Um, and animal studies didn't even develop until the 20th century. Um, uh, but the epidemiologic uh, uh, and clinical connection was made much earlier. Other examples that come from the unfortunately high levels of occupational exposures are things like asbestos, diesel, benzene, uh, gasoline exhausts, uh, other PAHs, um, dust, metal, silica, asphalt fumes, welding, uh, mining, mining and trucking industry that includes diesel, but other exposures. So you can see from the high exposure situation, the epidemiologic connections um, are often made. Uh, but um, then as Polly um, mentioned, policy-wise, this is tricky. This is OSHA's jurisdiction to protect workers from these things. In the environmental setting, often industry will say, well, those are high exposed workers. That's not the general community. General community is exposed to much lower concentrations. Show us the data. Well, the data has been pretty strong in the last several decades about ambient or community level exposures and cancer. What is this stuff? What is ambient air pollution? Well, it's, it is a complex mixture of both solid and liquid, par liquid particles of organic and inorganic substances suspended in the air that we breathe. Um, outdoor air pollution as a, as a whole, as an entity has been deemed by IARC. And if you saw Kate's presentations uh, early in this series, it was a wonderful um, a, show, a, a scientific approach to how these things are determined in, with a consensus approach. But they are group one, air pollution, outdoor air pollution is a group one um, carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Even though the constituents may change from place to place in the world, the aggregate data shows that air pollution is carcinogenic. But what does this mean globally? Well, broadly defined, air pollution is estimated to cause about 29% of the world's lung cancer deaths by WHO estimates. This is just highlights in the major air pollutants, air toxics, um, six of which are um, regulated by EPA as so-called criteria um, pollutants are on the table. I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but there are things like particulate matter that I mentioned, uh, some of which those are carcinogenic PM 2.5 by itself, 2.5 microns or smaller are considered carcinogenic um, even with some compositional variation around the world. That also includes things like ozone, sulfur dioxide, et cetera. Now, if you look at outdoor air pollutants and then cross to IARC's list of probable or known carcinogens, one is known, 2A is probable. Um, <clears throat> even if a lot of that data comes from occupational studies, the compositional, the, the elements are in outdoor air pollution. Some of the, many of the same elements that occur in industry, um, albeit lower concentrations, but this is a very complex mixture we're talking about. And so you can see this list, many of them are lung carcinogens and some of them are um, like some of the organic chemicals affecting uh, bone marrow and other uh, organs, perhaps even more than the lung, even if inhalation is the main uh, uh, route of um, entering the body. There's halogenated chemicals. These are volatile chemicals now like trichloroethylene, ethylene dibromide, um, and of course, the rich mixture of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons led by benzoate pyrene. These are also compounds, by the way, that are in cigarette smoke. So you see the, the toxicologic linkages, right? So you have occupational exposure, you have tobacco smoke, we have air pollution, you have big overlap in constituents. Um, so it's no big surprise uh, that outdoor air pollution could actually be quite a potent um, uh, cause of cancer in the world, cancers, plural, in the world. So even though it's a complex mixture in the aggregate, it is a definitely known uh, carcinogen. It's affected uh, health across the world. So American Cancer Society study, one of my favorite studies for 
nailing down some of the evidence. Again, probably referred to this, you know, our industry and, and standard setting in this country requires a lot of evidence. It's, it's good to have scientifically based regulations, of course, we don't want them to be arbitrary, but we see a lot of arbitrary um, challenges when the scientific evidence is actually there. Um, so the data was weaker in the 70s and 80s and 90s about how strong the relationship was of lung cancer to uh, say um, uh, air pollution. And um, the ACS study uh, that was led by Arden Pope and his colleagues that was published in the journal American Medical Association in 2002 was one of the sol most solid studies that nailed down not only the association but gave a dose response, exposure response between uh, PM2.5 and um, lung cancer. They also examined cardiopulmonary mortality and all cause mortality in this study, which is wonderful. Um, so they had a 1.2 million adults, a half a million adults were linked with air pollution data for the years 82 to 98. Um, and the, I think the importance of the study was not just the quality of the data and the rigor, but it, I felt it actually um, even surprised me at the magnitude of the effects uh, compared to what we had in the 70s, 80s. And, 90s when we were teaching our students about the potential of air pollution to cause cancer. So for every average of 10 micrograms per cubic meter elevation in 2.5, there was an 8% increase in lung cancer mortality, um, as well as the number of the non-malignant outcomes that they looked at. So this is the kind of data that does help lower um, standards or lower permissible exposures uh, when EPA um, uh, is renewing the um, uh, Clean Air Act periodically. Now, if you look globally, because that was US data only that I just showed, and look at PM2.5 and the Glo Global Burden of Disease Studies done um, by uh, the Global Burden Projects in London and the University of Washington, published in Lancet a couple of years ago, they looked at lung cancer and COPD mortality in 195 countries for the years 1990 to 2015. And you can see spatial and temporal trends in mortality in the burden of disease attributable to PM2.5 and their estimations for lung cancer risk in 2015 was almost 17 percent in 17 almost 19 percent so the trends are increasing for both malignant and non-malignant disease uh, related to air pollution PM2.5. So what does this mean? I talked to my fellow clinicians uh, it's almost like talking to patients. They feel powerless. They're like, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing things in the literature. Yeah, and these are interesting studies and they're scary studies, but what could I do as an individual? Well, uh, reducing exposure to air pollution is an important opportunity. One would actually, I think, say even an obligation for those of us in medicine, public health uh, for cancer prevention. But of course, the tools that are most familiar to individual clinicians, physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, others, um, like education about risk factors and steps that individuals can take are often insufficient for reducing these big issues of ambient air pollution because they, it's felt to be largely beyond the control of the individual. Uh, again, as probably alluded to, but there are things we can do. Um, and one is, of course, we need to inform patients. There are air pollution alerts that occur in advisories on the radio, this is often um, meant to protect people with asthma and non-malignant disease uh, with indoor alerts in certain parts of the country. Um, workplace controls seem very obvious because there's where the opportunity for engineering controls and product substitution has its greatest value. But um, when they're actually put into place in the workplace, they often improve community um, exposures as well, because if you substituted uh, a less toxic compound, a more toxic compound with a less toxic compound, you don't have ventilation pouring, exhaust ventilation pouring it out into the community. And then there are the practical things that we hear about in built environment, improving walking and public transportation, uh, reducing fossil fuel use. Now, the healthcare stream is an important issue because a lot of factors and uh, nurses and other healthcare workers can actually have an impact in this and healthcare Hospitals is a very is a very polluting industry. It's a dirty industry, loaded with carcinogen related issues and non carcinogen related issues. Um, and if 
healthcare or the hospital industry in the US were a separate country, I saw this estimated recently, it would be in the top 20 or so countries in the world uh, for pollution contributions and contributions to climate change in terms of CO2 and waste. And so we can look right in our own immediate environment and talk about reducing the waste stream from our healthcare facilities. That is within our reach. Um, energy efficient appliances and recycle and reuse. And then of course, advocacy. Another thing that health professionals often forget about, um, you don't have to be a scientist to advocate for good public policy and to educate the public on health issues. Um, <clears throat> the science, of course, is going to inform it by the organizations like the American Lung Association and American Cancer Society are very active in producing amicus briefs when court cases come up on the Clean Air Act. They're both really very strong, along with the professional society like the American, Cancer, American Thoracic Society um, in, pre in preparing these, but they also make public and professional education and priority. And you can become a quite a reasonably proficient speaker in advocating for environmental policy that reduces exposure to our carcinogens. And we have stature in the community, and so we should use it um, to advocate. Again, this is where we already have proof. This is not in that bad part of that cycle that Polly had where, you know, prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. And, industry will try to raise issues about uh, scientific quality. Actually, uh, science has generally moved in the direction. Uh, the arc of science has been to that we need lower standards in all of these things. We need lower exposure levels, lower permissible exposure levels. And therefore, sometimes the industry approaches to try to kill science, try to kill the messenger, because it is not coming out in their favor to do more uh, scientific research on this. Um, and of course, we need to uh, realize that the Clean Air Act is, is, um, gets reevaluated and needs to be protected. Uh, and health professionals can write letters, can get involved with their organizations in, in doing this. So advocacy is a very big part of it. So I will stop there. I think I did it well within my time. And thank you all. I look forward to the panel. Thank you so much, David. Um, really terrific presentation. and. Um, if you could stop sharing, that would be great. And we will now move on to our um, next speaker, who is Dr. Judy Wu. Judy is an epidemiologist with the Kirchhoff Group at the University of Utah and supports study design statistical methods related to studies of young cancer survivors and other relevant topics. Her research interests are in the exploration of how environmental and clinical factors may together affect the survival and severity of treatment-related morbidity among uh, cancer survivors. And I think you'll be very interested in this research that she's doing on the, the role of air pollution um, and their impact on uh, young people who have been diagnosed with cancer. Judy. All right, let me share my screen. All right, so I'm Dr. O, and I'm going to highlight some of my research that Polly described, and then I'm going to provide some ideas to address this topic from um, both clinical and also public health perspectives. So young cancer survivors, who I define as anyone diagnosed with cancer, are a growing population. Cancer incidence in children, adolescents, and young adults, or AYAs, has increased over the last 30 years. This is thought to be due to environmental exposures combined with windows of susceptibility and familial risk for disease. Due to effective therapies, these young survivors are expected to live for multiple decades after their diagnosis. Yet after this diagnosis, survivors live in the same environments that likely contributed to their initial cancer. And since young cancer survivors live for many years after diagnosis, they're exposed to these pollutants throughout their entire lives. So this figure shows the phases of cancer survivorship, starting with diagnosis and ending with an off therapy period around five years after that initial diagnosis. So we know that cancer survivors are exposed to air pollution all along these phases. And my research focuses on the impact of PM2.5 on pediatric and AYA cancer survivors. And we focused on young survivors because of their long life expectancy and their young age at diagnosis, which reduces potential for confounding from age-related conditions. However, young cancer survivors may be more frail than cancer-free persons due to the effects of cancer therapy. 
Because air pollution is a carcinogen, post-diagnosis exposure to air pollution may influence cancer mortality through continued carcinogenesis. To address this first question, we utilize statewide cohorts of pediatric and AYA survivors diagnosed in Utah. We measured cumulative monthly PM2.5 from their diagnosis onwards. And in the study, we focused on mortality at five and 10 years after diagnosis because these are commonly used prognostic timeframes. So I'm going to show you abbreviated results of our paper at five years after diagnosis. So we found marginally insignificant but positive associations for post-diagnosis exposure to PM2.5 and cancer mortality among pediatric and AYA survivors of all cancer types. Um, pediatric and AYA CNS survivors had significant increases in their risk for cancer mortality associated with PM2.5. We also found significant increases in the risk for cancer mortality among pediatric lymphoma and AYA carcinoma survivors associated with PM2.5. So carcinomas represent a diverse family of tumors, and we examined associations between PM2.5 greater than the federal health standard of 12 micrograms per meter cubed and cancer mortality among AYAs stratified by the type of carcinoma. We found significant associations um, for PM2.5 at the levels of 12 or greater and increases in the risk for cancer mortality among AYAs with breast and colorectal cancer carcinomas. So most of the positive associations in this paper were found in survivors whose initial cancer had a prior suggestion of an etiologic relationship with PM2.5. And this supports our initial theory of continued carcinogenesis due to post-diagnosis exposure to air pollutants. Together, these results suggest that reducing air pollution exposure after diagnosis may lead to reductions in five-year cancer mortality. So next, cancer therapies are extremely effective at treating cancer, but they come at a high cost. By adulthood, 60 to 90% of childhood cancer survivors develop a severe chronic health condition. In the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, the cumulative incidence of a severe or fatal health condition by age 50 was 54% among survivors compared with 20% among siblings. Cardiovascular disease, infection, and pulmonary disease are the leading non-cancer causes of death among adult survivors of childhood cancer. Air pollution is associated with many of the same heart and lung diseases that are major concerns among cancer survivors. So we wanted to understand if past treatment with chemotherapy modified survivors' respiratory sensitivity to PM2.5 greater than what's observed in cancer-free persons. We hypothesized that this could be due to the long-term damage to the lungs from chemotherapy and chest radiation. Additionally, cancer or its therapy may also cause long-term immunosuppression, leading to an increased risk for infection. This risk may be exacerbated by air pollution, which has also been linked to respiratory infection. To address these questions, we designed a case crossover study of five-year survivors of childhood cancers, and this population was matched by age and sex to cancer-free persons. We identified health events as respiratory hospitalizations and emergency department visits that occurred between the ages of five and 39 years. This is a fairly young survivor population. We quantified short-term PM2.5 averaged over the three days preceding these health events and their control days. So what did we find? So we found a significant association between PM2.5 and respiratory hospitalizations among the chemotherapy-treated survivors. The odds ratios for these chemotherapy-treated survivors were also significantly higher in cancer-free persons. This suggests that the long-term effects of chemotherapy may sensitize survivors to PM2.5 above what's seen in cancer-free persons. We also found a significant two-fold increase in risk for hospitalization due to respiratory infections among cancer survivors. And these odds were higher, but not significantly greater than odds among cancer-free persons. So I'm not saying that cancer survivors shouldn't receive cancer therapy. Quite the contrary, cancer survivors must receive the best therapy possible. But it's our challenge to provide patients with guidance about risk factors that can lead to poor treatment outcomes or poor quality of life. And by ignoring air pollution's impact on cancer survivors, we're missing an important opportunity to accomplish these goals. So the impact of air pollution on cancer survivors has largely gone unrecognized by both public health and oncology. The EPA has a course directed towards healthcare personnel on the topic of PM2.5 and patient health, but cancer survivors are not specifically mentioned as a group that may benefit from exposure reduction measures. This is a concern as young adult or adult survivors may not fit into any of the identified risk categories. 
recommendations from health providers are incredibly invaluable to initiating positive changes in patient behavior. And survivorship guidelines are one way to communicate these recommendations to patients and their families. And this is an excerpt from Children's Oncology Group's guidelines for pulmonary health. They tell survivors to avoid inhaling hazardous substances like tobacco smoke or toxic fumes found in the workplace. There is no mention about avoiding air pollution, which we know is a hazardous substance and also contains the same compounds that are found in tobacco smoke. This gap is also found in adult survivorship guidelines. So cardiotoxicity from therapy is a major cause of non-cancer mortality in breast cancer survivors. The current guidelines for managing cardiotoxicity from the American um, Cancer Society um, yeah, so the current guidelines for managing cardiotoxicity in breast cancer survivors focus on lifestyle modifications, namely diet and exercise. Uh, there's really no mention of air pollution as a lifestyle risk factor or a cardiac risk factor, even though air pollution causes cardiovascular disease like stroke or myocardial infarction, and also increases the risk for cardiac risk factors like hypertension. So there are many opportunities to advance clinical care and scientific collaboration in this space. So alongside engaging healthcare providers in policy discussions, we can explore the feasibility of integrating recommendations to reduce exposure to air pollution into survivorship guidelines. Most oncology professionals are already aware of these guidelines and refer them to their patients. On the public health side, we can explore the feasibility of naming cancer survivors as vulnerable to air pollutants and public health messages and risk assessment. The cumulative risk assessment is the characterization of health risks from multiple agents or stressors, including pollution, medication, and chronic stress. Cancer survivors are exposed to air pollution, air cancer therapy, and chronic stress from cancer and its financial implications. Yet there is little mention about how a cancer diagnosis fits into cumulative risk assessment for the health impacts of air pollution. So there's a perception that air pollution exposure cannot be prevented or altered on an individual level. So there are personal interventions being discussed in other medical fields, specifically cardiology. This includes a simple screening questionnaire to identify patients at risk for air pollution exposure. We can also test recommendations that these at-risk survivors wear an N95 mask when outdoors or install HEPA air filters in their homes. We also currently recommend that survivors exercise to strengthen their heart. Why not recommend avoiding outdoor exercise during peak traffic hours or avoid exercise near busy roads to reduce exposure to traffic? There are also many smartphone applications that report air quality. Healthcare providers can assist patients with interpreting the levels displayed by these apps. And last, there are clinical trials showing the benefits of dietary intake of vegetables like broccoli on speed, speeding the detoxification of compounds in air pollution. So we need more research to understand the impacts of air pollutants on survivors' morbidity and mortality. This includes investigations in heterogeneous populations as our Utah-based studies have been historically homogenous in terms of race. So Turner, Coleman, and Dupree have also published on the impact of air pollutants on cancer survivors. Their findings largely support the idea of continued carcinogenesis and the adverse impacts of air pollutants on cardiopulmonary mortality in cancer survivors. As air pollution and cancer therapies both have impacts on neurocognition and the endocrine system, more research about these endpoints is also needed. So we do not know the full extent of the impact of drug pollutant and radiation pollutant exposures. Survivors may have increased sensitivity to air pollutants due to chemotherapy-related toxicity, chest radiation, or extensive surgeries to the lung. Some survivors take long-term maintenance medications that increase their risk for heart disease, all while also being exposed to air pollutants that also increase risk for cardiovascular disease. So this interdisciplinary research may have far-reaching impacts outside the realm of cancer. Therapies used to treat cancer are also used to treat other diseases. And non-cancer medications may have cardiovascular and pulmonary side effects. It may leave more people more susceptible to air pollution-related morbidity. And these studies can be accomplished by combining air pollution exposure data with electronic health records or other population level data sets. We also need research to understand if air pollution or other environmental chemicals interfere with the efficacy of cancer therapy. As I've mentioned before, continued, carcinogen con continued carcinogenesis and pollution induced drug resistance are pathways by which pollutants may reduce the effectiveness of cancer therapy. 
Last, we need to understand what providers and patients think about environmental risk factors for disease. So healthcare providers spend little time in their education learning about environmental health. This may influence whether or not environmental risk factors are discussed in the clinical setting with the same weight as other individual level factors. And so integrating environmental health into conversations with, with patients is important. Currently, silence from healthcare professionals about air pollution can be interpreted as an absence of effect. These excerpts from interviews with caregivers of childhood cancer survivors convey their confusion about the relevance of air pollution to health. The majority of caregivers agree that air pollution was quote unquote, terrible, yet they disagreed about the impact of air pollution on the health of cancer survivors and even the health of the general public. These quotes also highlight an assumption that if air pollution was relevant for cancer survivors, the healthcare provider would have given the caregiver that information. Without clear messages from healthcare providers and public health, survivors and their families are left to their own inferences to navigate the many sources of information and misinformation available today. So with the current trends in cancer survival, we can anticipate the largest population of cancer survivors in the US than ever before. Numbers, their numbers are expected to reach 26 million in 20 years. And these survivors are forever changed by their diagnosis and the effects of cancer therapy. Um, and they live in the same environments that likely contributed to their cancer and are exposed to air pollutants that are known to increase risk for heart and lung disease. With imminent increases in overall air pollution exposure and the number of wildfires due to climate change, it is my opinion that air pollution is a risk factor that oncology providers cannot afford to ignore, and nor should cancer survivors continue to be overlooked in public health messages about air pollution. And so we can, through interdisciplinary collaboration, um, take actions to understand and address this topic. And we can do so by engaging healthcare providers to strengthen environmental policy, innovate on research, and create novel clinical interventions. And so I acknowledge and thank my many contributors. You two currently have two R03s to examine the impact of PM25 on cardiopulmonary outcomes in young survivors. And thank you for listening. I'm gonna stop my share. Thank you so much, um, Judy, for a terrific presentation. I know there will be questions for you um, in the Q&A and just inviting, reminding uh, participants to keep your Q&A open if you want so you can see some of the responses that are coming in. Um, terrific. So next we are going to hear from Mary White. Uh, Mary has broad experience in the development and implementation and translation of population health based health research. She currently is the chief of the epidemiology and applied research branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she directs a program of applied research and science dissemination to support CDC programs and partners. She oversees a portfolio of intramural and extramurally funded research projects um, that involve epidemiology, disease and risk factor surveillance, behavioral science, economics, and health services research. She's published and lectured widely on topics related to the control of chronic disease um, and in particular cancer. Mary. Oh, well, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, share. Okay, well, I do want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to um, speak to everyone today. Well, what a great presentations. Now, let me uh, get to the first slide. Ah. We are, oh, I know it's, um, Hey, Mary, just at the bottom Slide right of your show. screen, or that works too. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes, as we heard from the previous speaker, we have a large number of cancer survivors in this country, and that number is growing. So um, it's because of your great work that we are talking about cancer survivors, not just cancer deaths. And according to NCI, the number of cancer survivors will grow to over 22 million by 2030. And as the previous speakers highlighted, air pollution can increase the number of new cancer cases, as well as worsen the health of people who have received a cancer diagnosis. 
Whoops. Okay. Um, CDC takes a comprehensive approach to cancer control. Efforts to reduce cancer deaths are critical, of course, as are prevention, screening, and health and well being after a cancer diagnosis. This approach depends on collaborations and partnerships and is based on a guiding principle of equity. When some suffer disproportionately from cancer, we all suffer. And decades of research have shown that inequities in cancer risk factors and cancer outcomes are unfair, unjust, and avoidable. The problems go beyond the individual and reflect structural and systemic factors, including systemic racism. Marginalized communities are more likely to be exposed to higher levels of air pollution and more vulnerable to its harmful effects. These are complex problems. Looking at the data is a critical first step toward finding solutions. I'm going to highlight a few easy to use federal data resources that may be of interest to you your patients or others in your community. The first is US cancer statistics. Cancer is actually a reportable disease in every state. Two federal programs provide support to cancer registries, CDC's National Program of Cancer Registries and NCI's SEER program. US cancer statistics or USCS for short combines the high quality cancer data from both registry programs. The, this online resource provides the latest cancer information for the entire US population. The data are available in multiple data products, all accessible from the CDC website. With the USCS data visualization tool, we call it data viz, you can explore and use the data in a very easy way. You just point and click from different drop down menus and you can see cancer rates, cancer counts, and trends of new cancer cases and cancer deaths. You can also create customized maps and tables by cancer type, geography and population characteristics. Okay, the data viz tool includes data on the entire US population. So you can find data for the nation or just a particular state and county such as Gwinnett County, Georgia, which is close to where I live. You can also do a deeper dive and find statistics on other measures such as cancer survival, prevalence, and stage. In addition to data by state and county, data also are available by congressional districts for most states. This is a screenshot that shows you the type of information you can generate pretty quickly you need absolutely no programming skills. And for researchers who want to do more with the data, de-identified data are available at no cost. The databases include more than 31 million cases and over 18 years of data. Instructions on how to access the databases and supporting documentation are available at this website, the CDC website. And for those interested in learning, learning more about the registry programs, I've also included a link to an article that provides a little bit more information about the history of those programs. CDC also provides data on environmental quality and health outcomes, including air pollution measures, through its Environmental Public Health Tracking Program. I've included an email address here for more information about the tracking program. 
but let me share a little bit more. Similar to USCS, data is available both through online tools as well as data sets. And for today, I wanted to highlight the online tool for air quality. The tracking program provides data from the EPA for several different measures of air quality. For any measure, more recent or comprehensive data might be available from state or local agencies. For example, the Massachusetts Environmental Public Health Tracking Program does provide information on air quality measures from different monitors across Massachusetts. But this is what the CDC online tool looks like. What you can see is there are drop down menus, and the user can specify which air quality measure is of interest. Here I've selected PM 2.5 the geographic area, type, county, state, and the year. So you get a feel for what that's, it's pretty easy. And just like the US CS data is tool can create maps of cancer measures by county, the environmental public health tracking tool can create maps of air quality measures by county. The maps very likely won't line up even if, if higher levels of air pollution were in fact contributing to higher rates of cancer. These are after all descriptive measures kind of crude at the county level. So alone, these maps can't really be used to prove or disprove a causal connection. And if you're interested really in the cancer risk from carcinogenic air pollution, you know, that's better assessed by measures of the actual exposures, intensity, frequency, and duration, those sorts of things. I mentioned that the air quality data on the CDC website comes from the EPA. So another source I just wanted to mention is this. The EPA has a new data source that may be worth exploring called Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool, or EJ screen tool for short. Okay, so we've got all this great data. How can it be used to take action? Partnerships are key. Cancer disparities and air pollution are complex problems that require multiple voices at the table to find solutions. Medical providers are respected voices in those conversations. And partnership is key to CDC's National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, launched about 20 years ago. Through cooperative agreements with CDC, award recipients convene coalitions of a broad range of partner types to develop and then implement cancer control plans. Priority areas include health equity, primary prevention, early detection, and cancer survivorship. Current award recipients include all 50 states, the District of Columbia, seven territories, and eight tribal organizations. But cancer control plans are in essence a blueprint for action. Each plan is specific to a region and its population. Most get renewed regular, regularly like every five years. And for example, Massachusetts, in fact, is beginning to develop its next five-year plan and is currently recruiting new coalition members. So the coalitions rely on data about cancer to identify goals and priorities. The plans include interventions at environmental and policy levels to reduce cancer risk. For example, the Massachusetts plan includes multiple strategies to reduce exposure to radon. Plans emphasize effective strategies. And, but as one state program director told me, there has to be something to do about it. So with that in mind, our partners at the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors have been working with the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production and its partners on a series of webinars to address what cancer program staff 
have said they wanted to know about environmental cancer. The recording of the first webinar is available through this link, and the recording of the webinar held yesterday on interventions should be available in about a week. And more information about these webinars and how to register for them is available from our partners at NACDD, and I've included an email address here. So earlier this month, President Biden announced Moonshot 2.0, a bold initiative to end cancer as we know it. An innovative aspect of this initiative is the establishment of a cancer cabinet that brings together agencies across government, including not only CDC, NCI, NIH, but also other agencies like the EPA and USDA. The president's ambitious goal challenges us to step up our efforts on multiple fronts. Air pollution and cancer prevention. Actually, those topics intersect with current discussions about healthcare costs, racial justice, and climate change, and a host of other important issues. And your voices are critical to these conversations. So thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, um, Mary. It's really exciting to see CDC's leadership on integrating environmental chemicals and pollutants into the, the really um, extensive and important work that CDC does on, on cancer prevention more broadly. Um, so thank you. Our last speaker before we turn to some reflections and, and responses from three others is uh, Roseanne Bongiovanni, who is the executive director um, of Green Roots in Chelsea, um, just outside of Boston, across the Tobin Bridge. Roseanne um, has a master's level training in public health, and she's worked for environmental justice for more than 25 years. She began as a young organizer, also in Chelsea, um, engaged in various um, relevant organizing efforts, including defeating the construction of a diesel power plant, and also preventing ethanol uh, trains from traveling into Chelsea Creek Oil Terminal. Um, she transitioned this work into the Independent Environmental Justice and Public Health Organization, Green Roots, which is just a phenomenal example of a nimble, powerful, science-based, um, just a amazing uh, organization. So it's a privilege to be able to uh, introduce Roseanne and Green Roots to all of you. Um, so take it away, Roseanne. Thank you so much, Polly. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you um, for joining uh, this afternoon to all of the participants. As Polly said, my name is Roseanne Bongiovanni. I'm the Executive Director of Green Roots, and Green Roots is a resident-led grassroots organization in Chelsea that works to achieve environmental justice and improve public health in Chelsea and East Boston. While our work is hyper-low, uh, hyper-local in Chelsea and East Boston, our uh, impact is much greater in the greater Boston area, Massachusetts, and beyond. So we always think about Massachusetts as one of the most progressive states. We have all of the, the world-renowned academic institutions, the health institutions, and yet we're only one of two states that were ranked an F, a failing grade, for citing toxic pollution next to low-income communities and communities of color. The only other state was Wisconsin. And that was by the Center for Effective Government, which is now known as the Project on Government Oversight. So let me talk to you a little bit about what the cumulative impacts of toxic pollution look like in, in brown, black, and immigrant communities like Chelsea and East Boston. So Chelsea is Massachusetts' smallest uh, state at 1.8 square miles, and we're very densely populated. As you can see from this aerial photo, much of our uh, community is uh, zoned for industrial and commercial uses, and so folks are essentially living in 40% of 1.8 square miles, as you can see, very densely populated neighborhoods. We have over 45,000 residents who call Chelsea home, many of whom have uh, documentation concerns around immigration, and so they don't necessarily participate in the census. So we think our numbers are upwards of 50,000 residents living in 1.8 square miles. 
Of those who have participated in the census, 73% identify as ethnic and racial minorities, and 24% fall below the poverty levels. And that was pre-pandemic, and we know the pandemic hit our community extremely hard. In neighboring East Boston, the statistics are and demographics are very similar. East Boston is five square miles, of which three of which are taken up by Logan International Airport. There are roughly 55,000 residents who live in East Boston. Again, of those who are counted, 53% identify as Latinx and 17% fall below the, the poverty levels. What does it look like to live with disproportionate environmental health burdens and toxic pollution every single day? These are some views that you'll see um, if you live in Chelsea and East Boston or you come to our community. We are home to 100% of the jet fuel that's used at Logan International Airport. 70 to 80% of all of New England's heating fuel and gasoline and ethanol for hundreds of thousands of gas stations on the Eastern seaboard. We're also home to the largest uh, salt pile in this area. This road salt pile provides de-icing agents for over 350 communities in New England. And the second largest privately owned produce distribution center in the nation, as well as the Tobin Bridge, and the airport and a number of other commercial uh, and industrial um, burdens that are benefiting the entire region. Within Chelsea, 80% of our city is impervious, meaning it's gray, it's, it's cement, it's asphalt, it's not green. Only 5% of our entire city is open green space and only 3% is dedicated to parks and open space. Despite our valiant efforts to plant thousands and thousands of trees in Chelsea, we still have uh, a below average tree canopy cover at 2%. You can see in these photos that we have many streets that just simply don't have, have trees at all. Given all of that, you could just imagine that Chelsea and East Boston would be extremely impacted by COVID-19. We knew that our frontline environmental justice communities would be, uh, the hit, would be likely to be hit first and worst. We just thought it was gonna be a climate event and not a pandemic. I'm sure you saw it every single day for months on end that Chelsea was in the news, it was on, uh, on, on live news, it was in written media, it was all over the place. Internationally, folks were reaching out to, to people in Chelsea saying, I, I'm seeing you, I'm in Argentina and I'm seeing just how unbelievably bad the, the pandemic has impacted your community. We have been fighting for improved air quality for a number of years, for decades now really. And, um, and we, we knew that this work was incredibly important. We just, we didn't realize how much air quality and air pollution would, would impact our long-term health as we saw through COVID-19. So this is an example of how, when community gets together and fights through community organizing, how we, we can and, 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 uh, and should impact decisions that are being made for our community. So I'm sure many of you have heard about Cape Wind. That proponent was proposing clean, renewable energy for Nantucket, a wealthy part of Cape Cod. What folks didn't know was the other side of the story, that that very same proponent was proposing a dirty diesel power plant for the banks of the Chelsea Creek, right next to our elementary school, where every child in grades one through four attend. This is what the power plant would look like behind the, the playground at the school. We organized, we fought, we protested, we participated in decision-making processes. We did everything from the organizer's playbook. And ultimately, we were successful in stopping that power plant. And this is what the playground looks like today without that power plant. However, that was an amazing victory. And we celebrated for a whole, maybe one New York minute, because we realized when we were fighting that campaign, we were working very closely with researchers and academic partners who helped us to understand our air quality data. And as we were looking at this air quality data and celebrating this win, we said, we can't simply do nothing. Now that we understand just how severely impacted Chelsea is, we need to take action. And just to give you a sense of just how severely impacted we are, you know, I mentioned the Tobin Bridge and the airport, that results in 63,000 vehicular trips across the Tobin Bridge every single day. 37,000 truck trips to and from the New England Produce Center. Chelsea's diesel concentration levels exceed the EPA's level by 20%. Chelsea residents are two times more likely to face the risk of air pollutants than the rest, of, approximately the rest of the state. And we have 
approximately 1.5 times greater uh, cancer rates than all of Massachusetts. And you can see from this map on the bottom just how, um, how vehicular and on-road uh, pollution impacts the central core to the greater Boston area. This, these cars and trucks that you see here in this lower photo is just a daily reality for folks in Chelsea and East Boston. So we, we took that information and the data that we learned through the power plant campaign, and we looked at what is one of the single largest sources of pollution in our community. And we, we saw that it was the New England Produce Center. So the New England Produce Center is the second largest privately owned produce distribution center in the nation. It receives long haul truck trips from across the country in Arizona and Texas and California. And it's uh, bringing this produce in, temporarily storing it and then distributing it out through all of New England. And much of these uh, you see here, these are the, the sort of bays of the New England Produce Center and all of the trucks that are on site. So there are trucks that are bringing produce in, but as the produce center has grown over the years, it's also needed additional storage capacity. And so what the produce center was doing was using using the, the, the end, essentially, the refrigerator parts, the cabless parts of trucks to store fruit and produce. And in order to cool or warm those, um, those cabs, they were using these dirty diesel engines. So these dirty diesel engines are non-roadworthy. And so they were using the highest level of sulfur content diesel fuel to run these engines that were essentially going 24 hours a day. Around this time, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was being proposed. And so we saw that as an opportunity to seek some stimulus funds, uh, work together with community and business partnerships and address air quality concerns that we, we saw and recognized in Chelsea. And so as a result, we were able to repower or retrofit, repower means essentially destroy and, and, um, and replace uh, 132 dirty diesel engines in Chelsea at the New England Produce Center and adjacent businesses. We eliminated 2,000 tons of annual air pollutants and eliminated 400,000 tons of diesel fuel uh, every single year. That ultimately improved health outcomes and reduced um, health care costs for folks who uh, you know, weren't going to the ER because they couldn't breathe um, and, and hopefully saw improved quality of life. You know, the, the work continued over the years, and even though we had many, many victories and we saw that, um, that uh, you know, Chelsea's air quality was so significantly impacted, we still didn't know the real data because we didn't have air quality monitors in Chelsea. And so we were relying on data from the Back Bay, from Fenway, from other neighborhoods that don't have as many industrial impacts as Chelsea. And so we fought long and hard. It took many, many years, but ultimately this past spring, we were successful in, um, in working with the DEP and the EPA, so the State Department of Environmental Protection and the US EPA, to get our first stationary monitor here in Chelsea um, at a local park underneath the flight patterns of Logan International Airport. And we complemented that with nine mobile monitors that are throughout the entire city. And so at any point in time, we can log on to this website and some other websites to get uh, real-time data of what Chelsea's air quality is really like every single day. At the same time, we're looking at indoor air pollution. We know, as, as a, another a participant or, or a question in the Q&A said, folks are spending dozens and dozens and dozens of hours, you know, a week in their homes. And indoor air quality we see in Chelsea is also quite uh, impacted. We have identified this through our community-based research with Boston University School of Public Health and Harvard University School of Public Health and documented that indoor air quality is just as severe a problem as outdoor air quality. And so together with our partners at Boston University School of Public Health, we're working to install uh, 200 air purifiers in people's homes in Chelsea. And what we're doing is we're going in monitoring air quality ahead of time to see just how poor air quality is putting in an air purifier, monitoring the air, call, air quality with the purifier and talking with folks. How do you feel? Do you notice a difference? What is the impact? Is there an impact on your electric bill? Is it loud? Is it, you know, is it disturbing you? Um, what are your thoughts, concerns around using these air purifiers? The purifiers were made possible by a grant through um, the attorney, a settlement actually with the attorney general's office um, for a company that was violating air pollution um, violations. They had to pay a settlement and we were able to purchase some of these um, purifiers to address air quality concerns. So in about a year's time, I'm hopeful that we'll have really uh, important data to share back on just how improved um, air, indoor air quality is and how lives have been uh, positively impacted with this intervention. We also want 
to make sure that we're sharing Chelsea's story. As you're hearing me say it today, there are many of us who are talking about Chelsea and East Boston and the impacts that we're seeing and, and what COVID uh, did, you know, essentially, or how it impacted our communities. And so it's really important for community-led um, organizations and community members to share their data in a way that feels good to, to our community. And so we created this report. You can find it on our website. It essentially shows how all of the social determinants of health are intersecting and how cumulatively they have compounded our impacts um, or our vulnerabilities with COVID-19. But what this report also does is it put forth, it puts forth policy recommendations in environment and air quality and housing and a number of different of the social determinants of health on what we need to do now from this pivotal moment to change the course of our health and our well-being long term. It also shows the collective impact that we have had in addressing um, COVID-19 in Chelsea and just how powerful community is when it comes together. So I hope you will take a look at that report on our website. Um, I'd like to leave you with some lasting sort of uh, advice or thoughts. These are our internal sort of unwritten rules of engagement for working with uh, academics and healthcare providers. We ask that when you're thinking about partnering with community members and communities, especially low-income communities and communities of color, that you're first and foremost uplifting community voices, that those community voices, those lived experiences are being shared out and being recognized and valued. Don't be extractive. Don't come to community and try and take from community, get information, conduct surveys, and not share the data back or not appreciate and recognize and compensate those community members who are giving you their experience. We have been surveyed up the wazoo over the last few years, and many, many folks in Chelsea feel like the process is always extracted. And so we, we encourage and we work together with partners to make sure that they are not being extractive uh, to community members. Partner with community-based organizations and folks on the ground, but make sure they're leading, that they are really directing the community-based uh, research and the work. And then support community-led policy and legislative initiatives. At the very start of this, we saw that Polly outlined a number of different um, legislative priorities, some of which our board members and staff have helped to write, including the environmental justice protections in the uh, road climate roadmap bill. And so we we look to you all, the, the experts, the professionals in this field, um, to share data that helps us to marry our legislative and policy victories with real data and research. So if you can continue to partner with folks um, in community-based organizations to make sure that those legislative and policy uh, priorities are well supported by data and research that helps us to reach an end goal of really achieving robust policy and legislation that will impact our, our communities and communities to come for many, many years to come. Then share out the data. When you're partnering with us and you get data or you've done um, you know, research in community, make sure that you're sharing back the data. Folks always want to hear. What did you learn when you came and you did uh, indoor air quality in my home and in, indoor air quality monitoring? What did you get? Where did you hear? What, what did you learn? How can I make changes? And so share out that data, but make sure that you're sharing it out in a way that's easily accessible, multilingual, and can be uh, translated into multi different, um, different factors and through data visualization, as we've heard from prior um, speakers. And then, of course, always listen and follow the community. If the community says, nope, this isn't the direction we think we should go in, please listen to them and follow the community members lead. And lastly, I encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, on Twitter, um, via email, and to, um, and to consider partnering with organizations like ours more broadly. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to present, and I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Roseanne. Um, just amazing work and um, your tremendous resource for um, all of us about how to engage effectively and also how to um, achieve change. Um, so thank you for being here. So we're now going to shift to a little bit more of a conversational kind of format um, with three responders who um, have thought a little bit about what they wanted to say in advance and also who are going to uh, pick up some of the themes that have been lifted up by the speakers um, that we've heard so far. And um, so I'm first going to introduce um, Gwen Coleman, who is uh, just had a big week, which is that she stepped down from being the acting deputy director at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and is now a senior advisor um, to the director. So I imagine she's 
breathing a sigh of relief, but she served um, really ably in that role during a transition from the former director. Um, she has had a long career at the NIEHS. Um, before this role, um, she was directing the Division of Extramural Research and Training, and prior to that, served in program development and management um, beginning in the early 90s, uh, and then as a Chief of Susceptibility and Population Health Branch. So um, a, an amazing public servant. We're gonna hear from, from Gwen um, for a few minutes. And uh, then we're gonna move on to Dr. Narjust Duma, who is a thoracic oncologist and also the Associate um, Director of the uh, Cancer Care and Equity Center. Um, her focus is on women with lung cancer. Um, the research areas of interest that she has are studying the disease in young women and its impact on their physical and psychological well-being. And then finally, we're gonna hear from Ned Kutire, who is a retired pediatrician um, who has 26 years of office-based clinical practice with kids um, in the South Hills area near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics um, Council on Environmental Health. He's also a consultant to the Southwest Environmental Health Project, which is a nonprofit public health organization that focuses on the issue of fracking and shale gas development. He's also the board chair of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Pennsylvania. So a lot of direct experience about how a clinician can engage effectively in um, the work of nonprofits and um, work that impacts policy. So um, a few minutes from each of them, five to be exact, and um, we will then open it up to all the speakers to continue responding to the questions that haven't um, been answered in writing that the audience has raised. So uh, Gwen, take it away. Well, thank you, Polly. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be here with you today. And to all the speakers that gave magnificent talks, really sharing a lot of important information about air pollution and its cancer effects. I wanna follow on some of what Roseanne was just talking about in her discussion of the environmental justice and advocacy work in Chesley. And I'd like to reflect a bit more uh, on the um, details and share some more examples of how environmental health scientists and community-based organizations can work together to conduct this important research. It furthers the needs of the community and for scientists to identify credible, relevant, and real-time data. These partnerships help everyone work together, improving the lives of the residents who are unduly burdened by the environmental exposures. And today I'll focus on air pollution. So, I think this goes without saying, but engaging communities in the research process can build local capacity to address environmental health concerns. And you may be working on one specific problem, but the knowledge that's gained can be applied to many problems and many health outcomes. Uh, there are several important principles relevant to community engagement and the methodologies of community-based participatory research. I'd like to share a few and amplify what we have heard earlier today. Equitable partnerships are really necessary among all of the collaborators. Everyone needs to value the time and opinions of those who have the lived experiences and treat them as true partners and strong members of any teams that are working in this field. This is the only way to build trust between the researchers and the communities. And that uh, actually uh, gives enormous dividends as you go through the research process and the translation and dissemination of what you learn together. Building capacity by engaging these residents includes having them be data collectors, giving them hands-on training in using exposure assessment methodology and equipment. And it goes beyond just what they learn at the research table, they can use it in many other aspects of their lives. Forming community steering committees or advisory boards empowers the residents to share the local knowledge and express their concerns and their opinions and be heard by everybody at the table. We often um, encourage focus groups or other community meetings, including all of the study team members to report back community findings and explain in detail the impacts of the data. We encourage uh, uh, trainings on community action planning, and that is critical for the sustainability of the work uh, and letting it ha having it go as far as it possibly can in its translational efforts. So really what I'm saying is, is that all the work the planning of the research, the solutions that come from documenting health effects need to be co-created with 
by all of the members of the team, the scientists, the healthcare providers, and the community members. And, and they need to be co-developed in testable ways so that you can move from documenting findings from research to actually action that leads to better public health. So my agency, NIEHS, has had a longstanding commitment to developing and maintaining these important academic community partnerships. And supporting this work uses local knowledge to providing solutions. It's over almost three decades that we've been in this business and we really live by these um, community engagement uh, processes. So let me just share one example uh, I don't, in the, the remaining time. In, a, in another part of the country, in Imperial Valley, California, scientists came together from the California Health Department, the University of Washington, and the community-based organization Comité Civico de Valle. They came together to co-design a community monitoring program. And with support from NIEHS, they were able to place 40 low-cost air pollution particulate matter monitors in locations around the county that were not being captured by the traditional EPA monitoring systems. The community was better able to understand the air pollution patterns and inform actions to reduce air pollution and improve health. The citizens were empowered. They had the confidence to speak at governmental meetings and received a state contract to operate and process data and other grants to expand and maintain the air monitoring network, not only in their community, but also in other environmental justice communities across California. This, this network is sustained today by the Comité Civico de Valle. So I, I want to, um, I have several other examples that if the time up permits in the q and I'm happy to, to tell you more, but I hope I've been able to show you the strong benefits of these strong partnerships. And I want you to know that the powerful insights that guide the research and how community members are engaged in this and how they can then speak to their healthcare providers and how you as healthcare providers can provide answers to questions that they have is oh, very important in these preventive actions. NIEHS continues to support these efforts through our partnerships for environmental public health program. Please check out this program on our website at the Institute website and I'll put that in the chat and sign up for our monthly PE page newsletters where we continue to describe the inspiring work of these partnerships who are documenting hazards and co-creating solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gwen. And um, it's a good reminder that we are gonna be collecting resources um, from the speakers uh, after this and able to share those with the materials that'll be available um, about this session afterwards. And I will just put another plug in for the uh, source that Gwen just mentioned, the PEPH newsletter, which is just a wonderful way of staying on top of the relevant research um, and, and programmatic work that's going on, both uh, that NIEHS is supporting and, and other really good initiatives. So thank you, Gwen. Uh, and now I'd like to turn it over to um, Dr. Duma. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm taking five minutes of your time to share two ideas about um, environment and cancer. And the first one, um, they're, they're both connected. The first one is we have to see environment as a holistic part of our patient's care. Um, I think we have dissociated our patient's environment through weather conditions. So we have to stop seeing patients at first, you know, changing the language instead of saying lung cancer patients are patients with lung cancer. So that's something that happens to them and they're more than their disease. And as physicians and all healthcare providers, should we see environment as a part of our patient's care? As a cancer health disparities researcher, we know that 80% of patients' outcomes are not related to clinical care, are related to access to that care, are related to their environment, tobacco exposure, pollution exposure. So we focus on that 20%, the CT scan, the chemotherapy, which they are important, but 80% of our patients are more than that. Does your patient have access to transportation? And that is part of environment and that's part of access. There's a marker for lung cancer called PDL one that we make great decisions about immunotherapy in these patients. But that patient can have 100% PDL one but if that person doesn't have transportation, cannot be in a smoke-free environment, how important is that biologic marker? So the first idea in these five minutes is that we need to incorporate this, not only as a thing that we check in the chart, but as something that we continue to request our patients to inquire and to provide support after that, because our health is secondary to environmental exposures and what we do. And a lot of these has show the real 
through disparities in healthcare or disparities period. Populations of color, other vulnerable populations are the ones that don't have the privilege, particularly during the pandemic, to change jobs, change environments as easily. And we rate on being a very common cause of lung cancer, often housings, and we conducted a study in Wisconsin when I was there, these housings may don't provide, or may don't do the appropriate checking. So environmental challenges increase these disparities that we continue to see. And on top of that, they all multiply during the pandemic. So let's see our patients as a, as a whole, not only their disease, but what is around there, their family environment, what is access or lack of access to certain things, and where are they living, um, which is all important as the markers for the cancer and the CT scans. And my second story that I wanna take the, these five minutes is to tell you the tale of the physician and social justice. So I'm the, I had the privilege to come from a multi-generational family of physicians. My great-grandfather was the city council and also the doctor. He used to deliver babies and also uh, push policy. So we need to remember and we need to recapitulate the role of physicians that is not only to be in the clinic, barely answer any calls. This is our calling. Our patient's health is more than what we see in an appointment, mostly that we see in a paper that we write. And is that all healthcare providers have privilege. We do, We're, we have internet, we have electricity, we are educated, and we can use that privilege to create equity, not only at the moment of the visit, but the environment in which our patients visit, visit or patients live and what they need. Let's remember what my great-grandfather used to do. I'm not asking that we all run for office, but asking that we understand that our role as providers is beyond what we have been fixed in this box. We're advocates, we can be leaders. In our privilege, we help us create equity for the people that can do it. So my final two thoughts is for everybody here, even outside of healthcare providers, to have a lot of power to advocate for equity and for assure that our patients have safe environments particularly when they're battling cancer or surviving cancer. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Narjust. And our final responder is um, going to be Dr. Ned Kataire. Ned. Thanks, Polly. Um, uh, so as Polly mentioned, I live and work just south of the city of Pittsburgh in Washington County, Pennsylvania, which is just so happens to be the most heavily fracked county in the state. If you've never been here, uh, I would, would encourage you to come. It's really fantastic. Uh, but I'm sure you've heard stories about when the pollution from the steel mills and the coal-fired power plants darkened new, noonday skies. Uh, hell with the lid off is how some described this industrial city of coal, iron, and steel. Uh, and uh, the city's three rivers uh, were not a feature, but a bug in the landscape, uh, a convenient sewer for vast amounts of industrial waste. Uh, it was an area of the country where people emigrated from distant lands uh, for the promise of dangerous but steady jobs that also promised to shorten your life and threaten the health of your family and friends, even as it put food on your table. Uh, in this way, pollution was, and it still is normalized, uh, it's just the cost of progress. Uh, and the cancer people are still developing at rates higher than the national average has also been normalized. Poor Charlie has cancer. How unlucky is he? Well, no, uh, it's very likely that Charlie's cancer had nothing to do with luck and everything to do with the fine particle pollution and toxic gases that escape from local industry into the atmosphere like an open sewer. A lot of the steel industry has now left the region, uh, although US Steel still operates steel mills and cook facilities that still make the air stinky and my neighbors sick. Uh, while the air looks cleaner than it did back in the day, uh, we know that looks can be deceiving, but what's better than before is still not good enough for pediatricians like me who wish that so many kids didn't suffer the negative health consequences of so much progress. As Polly mentioned earlier, even reductions in smoking, which has been a huge public health success story across the nation over the last couple of decades, hasn't quite had the impact in reducing cancer risk for residents living here 
compared to other cities and counties with better air quality. In some Pittsburgh neighborhoods, uh, children have asthma rates nearly three times higher than the rest of the state uh, and the country because of the air pollution. Pittsburgh lies in the center of Allegheny County, which ranks among the worst 1% of counties nationwide for cancer risks from industrial point sources of air pollution. In seven surrounding counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, incident rates of six types of cancer strongly linked to toxic chemical exposure, uh, bladder, breast, kidney, lung, thyroid, and leukemia are elevated, some by more than 50% compared to national rates. Uh, I myself, um, I'm lucky enough to have survived kidney cancer a few years back, but I don't think it was bad luck that I developed it in the first place. But those of us living in Southwest Pennsylvania are exposed to greater levels of pollution than most other places in the United States. And that has disproportionate impacts on minority and vulnerable communities. And children might be the most vulnerable of all. Some counties in Southwest Pennsylvania have striking elevations of cancer incidents. The Pennsylvania Department of Health is currently investigating high rates of rare childhood cancers, including Ewing sarcoma in a four county region with high fracking activity. And there are new point sources of heavy industrial pollution coming down the pike that will impact the health of residents here. Uh, Shell, for example, is nearly done building a massive ethane cracker plant in nearby Beaver County, uh, one of the largest petrochemical facilities ever built anywhere. Um, uh, the Shell plant will take fracked gas and transform it into tiny polyethylene pellets in order to make single-use plastic, which everyone knows is one thing that Mother Nature doesn't need any more of. We know what happens uh, to cancer rates and overall health in people who live near petrochemical plants like this one. And many of us uh, here are afraid that our home in the upper Ohio River Valley will shortly become uh, America's next cancer alley, uh, just like in Louisiana and Texas, uh, just like in New Jersey where I was born and raised. So what should health professionals do to help their uh, patients? That was a question that David asked earlier. Uh, first of all, know your zip code understand where your area's environmental health threats are coming from. Know what neighborhoods your patients are coming from. Check local air quality forecasts at airnow.gov every morning uh, before you leave for the office or the hospital. Uh, this morning, once again, the closest air monitor to me is measuring the worst air quality in the nation for PM 2.5. That knowledge will help me take better care of my patients today. Advocate for your patients and teach them how to advocate for themselves. Uh, be courageous and speak up. Don't be afraid to talk with patients about air pollution or other environmental health issues or climate change. And finally, don't be satisfied with better than it was before. Uh, it's still not good enough. Putting a filter on a cigarette, cigarette might make it a little bit cleaner, but no doctor is going to tell you to go ahead and smoke it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ned. And I'd like to invite um, David and Judy and Mary and Roseanne to all come back onto the screen. So we have a, a little bit of a living room or a conference room of um, the voices that have been on this um, webinar so far. And just like to open this up for some very good questions that have come in from the audience. Also would welcome any of you who are, um, have spoken to uh, pose a question to a colleague or two. Um, but I'd like to start um, with one, and that is um, a focus on the issue of indoor air. There was a couple questions raised um, reminding us that most people spend their time, 80% uh, of their time indoors. And I know Roseanne um, echoed that and um, put forward an exciting program that they're involved in to help people monitor, um, go clean the, clean the air and, and uh, learn about opportunities for reducing those exposures. Um, there's related to that particular question um, is uh, someone who specifically would like to understand about these issues from the perspective of pediatric patients and survivors. Um, what can those caregivers do 
um, to help those pediatric patients understand the issues in the home environment, including simple steps that could help improve um, indoor air quality. So let me just throw that indoor air question out to uh, the group. Who would like to pick that one up? Well, in terms of simple steps, I'll just add one, one comment. And if anyone else wants to add to it, feel free. Um, there are a number of um, aspects of the indoor environment that uh, where, where interventions can reduce exposures and I'll lift up our um, wonderful institute, the Silent Spring Institute that has been a partner in planning these webinars. And they have done um, a, a number of research studies documenting that changes in the indoor environment can result in reduced exposures. One of the most the straightforward uh, recommendations is to do good vacuuming because um, some of these contaminants collect in dust and um, uh, reducing the dust levels can be very helpful. There's also a number of different tools um, that are available. We can again provide these after the session to help you choose among consumer products, household products that would be more or less um, toxic with chemicals that uh, may contribute to cancer and also other um, health problems. So uh, those are two thoughts on the indoor environment. Um, I would ask maybe David, if you have a, a response on the issue of sort of how important is the indoor environment from a cancer risk perspective relative yeah. to the outdoor environment and the exchange between the outdoor and the indoor. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's important. I think Linda and uh, Bern Barm and others raised that in the chat. So I was just thinking about it. Um, so a couple of things, I mean, one is, um, you mentioned some some simple steps for toxic use reduction, really, um, in terms of products. The other is um, ventilating uh, cooking stoves, um, whether it's gas or electric, doesn't matter. Gas gives off additional, additional oxides and nitrogen, but they all can give off carcinogens if you do high temperature cooking of uh, meats and even veggies with nitrosamines and PAHs. And they don't have to be fancy. This is going to become an economic issue. You know, thinking of Roseanne's talk, it's not like, okay, let's get you a, a state-of-the-art kitchen. Well, not everybody could afford state-of-the-art uh, kitchen ventilation, but sometimes even the hood ventilation that recycles the air, according to the engineers uh, like Petros Katrakis and others at the Harvard School of Public Health, does actually reduce exposures. Ideally, it should go to the outside. That's not always going to be available in the older housing um, like in Chelsea, because you have to bore a hole and have it done professionally. Um, but to the extent possible, outside venting really does a lot to reduce indoor air pollution, because apparently cooking is actually a major, maybe the major source um, in most of the colder parts of the country. Um, then PM 2.5 is a tricky one, <laughs> because uh, the smaller the particles are in the ambient air from either traffic or combustion, in dense communities like uh, Chelsea and parts of Boston. Um, the uh, standard home, even if you have a, a HVAC system that has these filters that you put in the plenum chamber that are rated, you know, like number eight on the MERV scale, they, they don't do much for PM 2.5. PM 2.5 gets right through virtually all of our uh, ventilation systems, even in the hospital environment, except for the ORs. The operating rooms have very high filtration efficiency, high efficiency filters that will uh, filter out viruses in very small particles. So 2.5 equilibrates, unfortunately, with the outside pretty readily, which is why we have to reduce community air pollution. And in that case, we'll also reduce indoor air pollution, including traffic associated particulates. It is somewhat better inside with caps, maybe as much as 25% or whatever, but we need to get the community down um, indoor, versus outdoors, biggest gradient is with ozone, where it is tremendously lower inside than outside because ozone is such a reactive gas, it just sticks to surfaces. And so there's an air pollution alert. Um, it's usually geared, uh, if you stay indoors, it will make a difference as far as ozone. The other is site, just look at to um, teach, either do the audits or teach the community how to do their own audits. Is there asbestos in the basement? Yes or no, what does it look like? Do you, you, know, <clears throat> you know, a walkthrough, for things like asbestos and a simple test for radon will actually help 
empowered people to, you know, uh, at least identify it and hopefully get rid of it um, in the most cost-effective way as possible. There's a lot of environmental quote unquote companies that kind of like rip people off, make you think if you have a high rate on you have to spend 40, 50,000 on French drains and vents and all that. That's not actually true. You just actually put a, a small fan in the basement uh, that's not even vented to the outside. You can reduce radon levels to zero. Why? Because radon will stick to the walls, radon gas, and will not come off. And so even a small computer fan, uh, size fan could actually reduce rain on in the basement in the first floor. So there are these things that I think can be done and should be probably part of, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what Roseanne thinks about this, you know, a community, you know, kind of an audit and action plan rather than an audit and then, okay, you got problems, figure out how to pay for it. But these things can be done um, cost effectively. Great, Roseanne, did you want to add anything? Yeah, thanks, David. I, I really appreciate what you said. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we've learned through our community based research is that, you know, it's not necessarily common knowledge that people are thinking about their indoor air quality and what they are personally doing that could potentially impact their their air. I think from our perspective, we had focused so intensively on outdoor air quality and what are all of these industries doing to impact our lungs? What are they doing to impact our environment? But then when we were doing the indoor air quality work, you know, talking with folks about, are you using a gas stove? It's, I think it's becoming more commonplace now that people understand when you're using a gas stove, it needs to be properly vented. Otherwise that is um, uh, exacerbating indoor air quality problems. But I think a lot of folks don't necessarily know all of that or think about that. And so that's why uh, sort of pointing back to working with researchers and partners that we need to share the data back and say, okay, this is what we found with your indoor air quality. And these could be sources. It could be, you know, you're not properly vented um, gas stove. It could be the candles that you're burning that, you know, people don't think about, oh, I'm burning a candle. That's actually not great for your health, right? Um, I'm putting hairspray in my hair, perfume on my body. I'm spraying a chemical to, you know, get rid of the ants that are by the front door. You know, these things that, you know, we all sort of take for granted. We don't think about adding them all up is actually um, worsening our indoor air quality. And so I think it's important to sort of start at the grassroots level and say like, what can we do individually and what can we do you know, community-wide and systemically to address indoor, outdoor um, air pollutants. So love the idea of the audit, um, sounds pretty cool. Thanks, Roseanne. Um, I'm gonna move on to another question, just a sec, but Judy, I wondered if you had anything more to add on the indoor air quality question. I feel like Roseanne and David covered a lot of what I was going to say. I was just going to reiterate the importance of testing your home for radon particularly among a cancer population. We know that cancer survivors are at high risk for second neoplasms. And so reducing exposure to known carcinogens like radon in the home can be a cost-effective approach to, you know, to lower your risk for, for cancer. So, um, and I, I really love what Roseanne and David shared. Great. Thank you. Sorry to just add about the radon as a lung cancer patient, I see the other side, unfortunately, when their patient already has the cancer. And I would say 80 to 85% of my patients have been tested radon for two decades since they purchased a house. And in the Midwest, uh, the, the, the numbers can be longer. So, you know, I just want to, I see the other side. And I think it's important that we include that as a public health, not only when you buy the house, but it continues to be assessed. Thanks, Nerjust. Good. So we have a couple of questions that relate to how to engage health professionals in um, community and um, policy level action. And someone from the Louisiana area who is talking about state agencies um, not being supportive, essentially dismissing pollution concerns, using data that they have to do that. And she wonders about whether there's a listserv of epidemiologists or experts that they could reach out to um, when they need experts to weigh in on these local issues. And then um, someone here locally who's asking about um, uh, the potential for health leaders to participate in a coalition that's working specifically on policies related to toxics and what is the best way to engage medical professionals um, in that work. So um, I would uh, like to, to maybe invite um, 
Gwen, if you could say anything about your thoughts about sort of networks of um, environmental health experts that might be available and how to access that, your suggestions there. Sure, Polly. I, I'm not familiar with a single listserv of identifying researchers who would uh, be interested in working directly on these issues, but there are a few things. There are some um, really awesome scientific societies, the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, the International Society for Exposure Science, have wide membership around the world of experts who engage in the research that would be relevant to the situation in Louisiana and other places. And you can um, you know, sort of see who the leadership is there and try to make some contacts. Uh, NIEHS has a network of what we call our NIEHS centers of excellence around the country. We have about 22 of them and each of them have membership of uh, folks in many disciplines that are conducting environmental health and toxicology work. And each of them has a community outreach and education co uh, engagement core. Um, and so that on the NIEHS website, there's a map of those centers. And uh, I don't know that we have one in Louisiana, but we do have several in Texas. And so it's possible you might be able to reach out to a neighboring state uh, where experts might be interested in the topics that you're talking about. Great, thank you, Gwen. And we are just about to um, pass this back to Tim Rebeck for a wrap up. Um, but I wondered, um, Ned or, or Mary or anyone else, any other comment about this question about how to find um, health experts, clinicians who can, can help out with these issues outside of the clinical setting? I, th oh. I think, it, oh, go ahead, please, go ahead. I was just gonna mention quickly, following up the previous conversation of radon, that I've put in the chat two resources from the Massachusetts Department of Health that people may find of interest. Thanks, Mary. And we'll be sure to add those to the resources that we make available to everyone later. Yeah, thank you. Ned. And, yeah, just quickly, it's hard to organize physicians, uh, I find. Uh, everyone is involved in their own way to save people's lives uh, that are uh, very, very important, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, academies. Uh, the AAP has the um, uh, the environmental health, uh, the Council on Environmental Health and Climate Change, which is very active. Uh, I'm sure the ACP has a similar type of uh, situation going on there. Um, but you know, it, it's really, really tough. What I tell people is talk to your patients. Uh, start generating interest on these topics from your patients. Uh, we're all, all of us are patients. Everyone on this call, everyone listening is a patient, right? So, so you, there's an opportunity at every visit uh, to talk about these issues. And that th those conversations really should start from the doctor. They should come from the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the PA. Uh, and that's how you get people talking about it. Uh, that's how you get uh, colleagues in the medical uh, establishment talking about it as well. And that's probably the most practical way to get health professionals involved. Thank you, Ned. And I'll just put a plug in for www.cancerfreeeconomy.org. Um, we are a network that has a number of health scientist uh, experts that we'd be delighted to have those of you who would like to connect with um, those kinds of resources to be in touch with us. So we could spend a lot of uh, additional time having a fabulous conversation. I wanna pass it on to Tim because we are at time, but just uh, my thanks to all of these fantastic speakers um, and again to the participation um, from so many of you in the audience. Tim. Thank you, Judy. Did you have one other final comment before I wrap up? I, you looked like you were trying to say. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, in my interactions with clinicians on the topic of environmental health, they're really hesitant to bring up this topic with their patients because it doesn't appear that there is a clear clinical answer or something that the patient can do. And so clinicians are hesitant to raise concern if they can't immediately provide some type of treatment, right? But I think that the best part about a webinar series like this is that we are connecting physicians to scientists and resources that can provide patients with tried and true interventions and methods that they can use to address these environmental exposures. Um, and so I just, yeah, that's basically what I was going to say. Great, Judy, thank you that you uh, said everything that I could better than I could about wrapping up. So that's a fantastic uh, ending statement. And I just wanna thank all our speakers, an amazing 
uh, presentations and amazing discussion. Uh, and I just wanted to make two points. Uh, our third and final session of, of this series will be on Tuesday, March 1st. Uh, it's going to be on primary prevention and the role of clinicians as trusted communicators, barriers and opportunities. So obviously following up on many of the points that were made today. So I hope you can join us for that. And also if you're doing uh, continuing medical education or nursing professional development credits, please uh, complete an evaluation. You'll need to do that in order to get those credits. So we, and we'd love your feedback. So thank you again for part, all the participants and uh, to the, for, for a really great, interesting session. And I look forward to seeing you all on March 1st. Thank you.